Good evening. It's a great pleasure to welcome to Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government tonight Governor Chuck Robb, Senator Dale Bumpers, Tom Patterson, a political scientist, and several journalists who will be our panelists, Phil Gailey, David Schribman, and Mark Starr. This event is part of a series that the school is sponsoring on campaign, campaign 1988, which uh, has already begun. For the next year and a half, those of you who uh, uh, can stick to it will have the opportunity to hear from key players from both parties, as well as a number of, of programs examining key issues and the campaign process. Tonight's uh, panel, somewhat fortuitously, which was arranged uh, some uh, months ago and is co-sponsored by the Democratic Leadership Council, is entitled, quote, The Distorting Lens, The Media and Presidential Politics. And perhaps before we get to local events or current events, it's worth denying categorically that there's any direct connection between this topic and anything that you've been reading about in the news lately. <laughs> Though I must say that uh, I can't uh, pass without comment on the irony of this topic with these current events in a school that is named for John F. Kennedy. <laughs> Oscar Wilde once observed that in America the president reigns for four years and journalism governs forever. Wendell Phillips once quipped that we live under a government of men and morning newspapers. Today, television creates the theater in which candidates appear for viewers. Politicians are groomed, events scheduled, body language practiced, and themes honed to please the camera's eye. Even some local pol politicians are known to have acquired hairdos and tummy tucks in order to be more with it. Okay. Now, at last month's announcement of Marvin Kalb as our new director of the Joan Shorenstein Barone Center for Press Politics and Public Policy, which will be the newest of the school centers, Marvin told a story that is directly on point. In the 1984 election, CBS had run a two-minute piece on the Reagan campaign that was highly negative in the language and, and the report of the language criticizing Reagan's ducking substantive issues in favor of happy talk, but running pictures of Reagan on the stump campaigning. The network expected a blast from the White House press office. Instead, the correspondent got a call congratulating her on the story, applauding the pictures with no comment on the words. The issue before the House tonight, therefore, is how voters can become aware not only of the images but also of the issues and the characters themselves. Introducing tonight's panel will be former governor of Virginia, Chuck Robb. Chuck grew up in Arizona and Virginia, att attended Cornell, and earned his BA from the University of Wisconsin in 1961. He joined the Marines and was later assigned to the White House, where he met his former wife and was married to presidential daughter, Linda Bird Johnson. <coughs> Sorry, met his wife-to-be, apologies and excuse me. Uh, who will remain his wife uh, to his good fortune. In, in 1967, he became an infantry commander in Vietnam where he won bronze and, civil star, and silver stars. Chuck was elected Lieutenant Governor of Virginia in 1978. In 1982, he became the state's first Democratic governor since 1965. While governor, he cut the state's budget three times in the first three years, began a successful information clearinghouse for high-tech firms, reduced the number of state employees, and named the first black to the state Supreme Court. He was also elected chairman of the Southern, Southern Governors Association and of the Democratic Governors Association. After state law prohibited Chuck from running for a second term, he joined with other moderate and conservative Democrats, including Sam Nunn, Bruce Babbitt, and Richard Gebhardt, to form the Democratic Leadership Council, the co-sponsor of this event here tonight. The goal of the council is to reclaim the party from special interests and to encourage the nominating of a winning presidential candidate. Some critics accuse it of being the white male caucus, claiming it is trying to out-Republican the Republicans. But less partial observers defend the group, including New Republic columnist Fred Barnes, who wrote, quote, 
Rob, in four months as DLC chairman, produced more fresh thinking than any other Democrat in the country, close quote. Despite the wishes of some party leaders, Chuck asserts that he is not interested in running for president in 1988. He can't somehow get his name off the A-list of vice presidential possibilities, however. Dave Rob commented, and again I, sorry, Dave Broder commented, and again I quote, Rob is everything that the Democrats want. He's movie star handsome, comfortable on TV, <laughs> middle road but modern in his thinking, well-connected, southern, and dazzlingly, dazzlingly successful as a politician, close quote. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Governor Rob, who will introduce the rest of the panel, which will be moderated by Senator Bumpers. Thank you, Dean. I don't know where you get all your material from, but I'm delighted to be here. Let me clear up. This was, this was not designed to be a hard news program, and although I have not conversed with my wife in the last couple of hours, as far as I know, there is no former attached to that particular relationship. We are delighted to be here, and, and uh, the events of the day have caused a uh, slight change in our lineup that uh, Senator Bumpers will talk to you about in just a minute. Let me begin, if I may, by thanking Harvard University and the Kennedy School of Government for inviting the Democratic Leadership Council to come and join you this evening in Cambridge. The Kennedy School certainly has emerged as a premier center for the study of American politics and governance, and we really appreciate the opportunity to share this forum with you. Before proceeding to our topic, I'd like to explain very briefly the role of the Democratic Leadership Council which has recently emerged as a new force in American politics. The DLC is really a response to change, the end of the New Deal consensus and the dawn of a new era characterized by two realities, political parity and the primacy of ideas. Without the natural majority that we enjoyed for nearly 50 years, Democrats are simply going to have to build a new winning coalition in each election. We're going to have to compete on the basis of broad ideas and not narrow interests. In a fluid and fiercely competitive political environment, Democrats need to develop the continuous capacity to seize the intellectual initiative, to set the terms of national debate. That's what this group is really all about. And we believe that elected Democrats, whose ideas and convictions have been tested at the polls, ought to have a major role in shaping the party's message and articulating its broad agenda, because they are uniquely positioned to supply a vision of the whole against which the claims of the parts must be weighed. So the DLC's fundamental aim is to infuse the Democratic Party with a new sense of national purpose. Ultimately, of course, a political party is defined by its standard bearer. Therefore, how we choose our presidential nominee becomes terribly important. Between the voters and the candidates stand the media. And tonight, we'd like to explore their role in framing that choice. In physics, the Heisenberg principle holds that the act of observation inevitably disturbs the object under study. Extending this principle to the realm of politics, how does media coverage influence the way candidates run for president? We believe it's important to examine this question now before the 1988 presidential campaign begins in earnest. In tonight's forum entitled The Distorting Lens, the media and presidential politics will discuss some of the most frequent criticisms about the way the media cover the presidential nominating races. Perhaps the most common complaint is that the media grossly inflate the importance of early contests in the relatively small states of Iowa and New Hampshire. The extent of exaggeration is vividly and perhaps, perhaps comically illustrated by the chart that is over here behind me. The bottom figure is a map of the United States scaled in proportion to the number of electoral votes that each state represents. The top figure scales them according to the amount of media coverage that their presidential nominating contest got in 1984. As you can see, Iowa, and particularly the Colossus just north of here, 
dwarf such otherwise insignificant states as Texas, Florida, Ohio, Georgia, and Massachusetts. The contests in Iowa and New Hampshire certainly are interesting and even important, but should they really be decisive? How can we restore some badly needed perspective to the coverage of these preliminary events? What difference is the heavy concentration of primaries and caucuses on Super Tuesday likely to make? These are some of the questions that we're going to try to answer tonight. This forum is part of the DLC's Super Tuesday Education Project, or STEP, which is a nearly year-long campaign designed to heighten interest and turnout in the presidential nominating race and to focus the political debate on issues of broad national concern. What impact Super Tuesday will have is the great unknown in the 1988 nominating race. On March 8th, no less than 20 states will hold caucuses and primaries and will elect approximately one-third of the delegates to the Democratic National Convention. Stretching from Hawaii and the Pacific Northwest to New England and to the South, Super Tuesday is really the first national primary and it will truly be a national primary if California decides to move its date to the same date. Although some members of the DLC, myself included, advocated Super Tuesday, the DLC as an organization did not create it. We do, however, intend to make the most of it. Starting here in Massachusetts, the DLC will stage a series of events and forums in Super Tuesday states. We hope to give candidates opportunities to venture outside of Iowa and New Hampshire and to give people new reasons to come out and vote in our party's primaries. Our next big event will be a Super Tuesday Summit on June 22nd in Atlanta, which will bring elected and party officials from all the Super Tuesday states together to promote the interest in the issues that we think ought to be at the center of public debate and to get people thinking about what's at stake for them in Super Tuesday. The media, of course, are the conduits through which the candidates and the parties deliver their message. And that's why we're starting this effort by examining their role in the nominating process. With that background, I would like to introduce the moderator of tonight's forum. He is Senator Dale Bumpers, certainly a leading light in the United States Senate and in the Democratic Leadership Council. Senator Bumpers has earned a national reputation for forceful leadership on such critical issues as economic growth and equity and nuclear arms control. He recently disappointed many admirers by announcing that he would not seek our party's nomination for president. Nonetheless, I would venture to predict that his voice will be heard and heeded by those who have entered the race. Without further ado, I will present Senator Dale Bumpers and turn the program over to him for the conclusion. Dale? Chuck, thank you. Thank you. I hope you noticed the difference in the length of the, in the introduction that Dean Allison gave him <laughs> and the introduction I got. Yeah. Chuck leaned over me, Graham, while you were introducing me, said, I could listen to this all night. And I said, I think you're going to get to. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to ask for equal time. Well, to join my very distinguished good friend, uh, Governor Robb, here this evening, let me also express my gratitude to the Kennedy School for making this forum available to the Democratic Leadership Council and to express my thanks to you on behalf of the DLC, all of you in attendance, for coming tonight. We hope it will be an interesting session for you and it will be edifying. The presidential nominating process is a subject of much argument among Democrats. Some say it's too long that it's too front-end loaded, and that it forces candidates to behave in ways that are detrimental to their chances in the general election. Repeated efforts to reform the process have only intensified the debate. The iron law of unintended consequences has operated with a vengeance, spawning a new problem for every old one solved and leaving nobody entirely satisfied. I say this because it's important to, to acknowledge that if media coverage of the nominating race is flawed, it certainly may be in part because the process itself is seriously flawed. The media perform a vital function as the means by which political candidates communicate with the general public. Yet the media is not an inanimate device 
a perfectly neutral machine like a telephone. It is also a business and a very competitive one. And business values don't always coincide with political values. On the other hand, if everything politicians say and do is treated as real news, there'd be little else in our newspapers and on our television sets. So we have an inherent conflict between what the media wants to report and what the candidates want reported. Both sides have legitimate complaints about the other, and our purpose here tonight is to discuss those complaints. To frame the discussion, let me pose a number of questions that go to the very fundamental issue of whether the public or the candidates are well served by the way media covers presidential uh, politics. Is media coverage fair? What determines how much a particular candidate receives? Have the early contests in Iowa and New Hampshire, as Governor Robb has pointed out, been blown completely out of proportion? And if so, if so to what extent and for what reasons? To what extent do members of the media cease being observers and become participants in the process? Have the major parties surrendered the power to set the terms of political debate to the media? Do the media set arbitrary standards for picking winners and losers, and thereby winnowing the field to suit their convenience? And finally, how will Super Tuesday affect the way media covers the race in 1988? Our featured speaker this evening is Thomas Patterson, professor and past chairman of the Department of Political Science of the Maxwell School of Citizenship at Syracuse University. He's written widely and perceptively on the interplay between press and politics. Mr. Patterson's books on the subject include The Unseeing Eye, The Myth of Television Power in National Elections, and The Mass Media Election, How Americans Choose Their President. We're also fortunate to have with us three accomplished representatives of the national political media. Phil Gailey is a national political correspondent for the New York Times, where he's worked since 1981. His previous newspaper experience includes stints with the Miami Herald, a newspaper of some note, <laughs> the Washington Star, and the Atlanta Constitution. He is a native of Homer, Georgia. I guess he can tell us that he's not prejudiced towards Senator Nunn, and a graduate of the University of Georgia. David Shripman is national political correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. He joined the journal in 1984 after serving as a political and congressional correspondent for the Times a national staff reporter for the Washington Star, and a city and Washington reporter for the Buffalo Evening News. He's a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Dartmouth. Mark Starr is currently Boston Bureau Chief of Newsweek, where he's worked since 1981. He was previously a general editor at Newsweek in New York. He's also worked as a correspondent for the Journal and the Chicago Tribune. He holds a master's degree in communications from Stanford. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Patterson, who will lead off. Professor? In 1921, as the progressive era was coming to a close, Walter Lippmann warned against looking to the press as a corrective for the defects in the practice of democracy. The press, Lippmann said, is no substitute for political institution, and if anything, will only magnify their flaws. I share Lippmann's view, which leads me to believe that the real problem of today's presidential election campaign lies deeper than the press and its coverage. The great flaw of the modern system of electing presidents is that it asks the press to do what the press is not designed to do. The business of the press is news, not the formation of majorities or the exercise of leadership or the articulation of policy issues. Yet we expect the press to do these things and more in presidential campaigns. No other leading democracy has chosen this course. Only in the United States is the press asked to organize the public's nominating choices. Elsewhere, that responsibility rests with the political party, an institution that is uniquely designed and suited to that difficult task. But our problem tonight is to accept the presidential selection system as it is, and to inquire how the press might do a better job in its role of principal intermediary between the candidates and the voters. Let me start by identifying some of the problems with existing news coverage that distort the presidential selection process. First, the, the press has a game perspective of presidential elections, concentrating primarily on the, con on the competition between the candidate players. Questions of national policy and leadership are part of election news but they serve primarily 
as a backdrop to the ongoing struggle between the candidates for competitive advantage. The flow of news is mostly about winning and losing. Poll results and election returns, campaign strategies and tactics, campaign stops and hoopla, these are the main subjects of election news coverage. The substance of the campaign is only a secondary theme. The candidates' position on issues as outlined in their speeches, issues of past performance, questions of ability and questions of character. These are relatively small subjects in the overall portrayal of a presidential campaign by the press. The press also distorts events that it sees as critical to the game's outcome. Iowa and New Hampshire are examples. Perhaps you can tell by the distorting uh, size of New Hampshire and Iowa in the chart that uh, Governor Robb pointed out earlier that they receive about a third of all of the coverage given the nominating contests of the states. And having built Iowa and New Hampshire into decisive contests, the press then treats the outcome of these contests in rather simple win or lose terms. The 1976 Democratic primary is a case in point. That primary, in my judgment, had a very uncertain outcome. The only candidate from the center or the right in the Democratic primary of New Hampshire in 1976 was Jimmy Carter. Scoop Jackson had decided to wait a week and enter in Massachusetts. George Wallace had decided to wait until Florida. From the liberal wing of the party, there were four candidates, Udall, Shriver, Harris, and Bayh. Carter had 28% of the vote as the lone centrist or right candidate. Udall had 24% of the vote, only 3,000 votes behind Carter, running against three other liberals in that race. But to the press, it was an absolute victory for Jimmy Carter. They named him the national front robber, runner, but more importantly, bestowed upon him a news windfall. The clearest example was Time and Newsweek. He appeared on the cover of Time and Newsweek magazines, and on the inside of those magazines received 2,600 lines of coverage. Morris Udall had 90 lines of coverage. The news windfall that followed the 1976 New Hampshire primary, in my judgment, was the driving force behind the Carter bandwagon. The press's game orientation also affects the way in which candidates are portrayed. It's hard to be behind and to have a good image in the news. Two days after the 1984 election, Walter Mondale announced a press conference or called a press conference to announce his retirement from politics and also to caution his party against ever again nominating someone like himself who was weak on television, which was a common statement or common complaint about the Mondale press that had been rendered by the press. But how weak was Walter Mondale on television? In two debates with the great communicator, he won clearly the first of those debates and, and uh, drew Reagan to a draw in the second debate. In his acceptance speech uh, at the National Convention, Walter Mondale give, gave a fairly good speech, and in the polls that followed immediately after the convention, closed the gap between himself and Reagan to two percentage points. Walter Mondale's performance in a debate in Georgia was important for his comeback on Super Tuesday uh, in 1984. What the press was inferring from the fact of Walter Mondale trailing Mr. Reagan in the polls was that somehow Walter Mondale was defective as a campaigner. And with television being the center of our presidential politics, he must therefore be weak on television. The elections game also affects issue coverage by making the candidates' game mistakes and misjudgment big news. The longest running headline stories are not the candidates' positions on the great issues of the day. They're not about the economy or social welfare or U.S.-Soviet relations, but primarily about the candidates' gaffes and disputes. In 1976, the longest-running stories were Carter's Playboy interview and Gerald Ford's comment about Eastern Europe being free from Soviet domination, a claim that no one, not even Ford, took very seriously after the debate. In 1980, the longest-playing issue was the debate about the debate. You may have forgotten about that one. This was the dispute between the Anderson, the Carter, and the Reagan camps about whether there would be televised presidential debates, and if so, who would participate. In 1984, the issue that was in the headlines for the longest period of time was not that of a presidential candidate, but that of a vice presidential candidate, Geraldine Ferraro's tax problems. And in 1988, it looks like uh, we've already started uh, the campaign issue of the year uh, in Mr. Hart and 
and the question of sex and privacy. These kinds of issues are at the top of the news because they are good news, however insignificant they may be to the question of who would make the best president. Finally, I should note Michael Robinson's findings about negative spin, the fact that candidates on the whole get bad press. The problem of losers has already been identified by the illustration of Mondale, the television wimp. The winners typically fare better, but only in the immediate aftermath of the early contests, like Iowa and New Hampshire. Later, they also take a hammering. From the press's game perspective, the winners are portrayed as masters of manipulation. Their policy promises, for example, are often presented as mere vote-getting ploys, as if candidates never take stands out of principle. And thus, we have the curious case, late in the 1980 campaign, of a number of news stories suggesting that Ronald Reagan was not, his, was not what his speeches pictured him to be, even though he had been giving the same speech for about 15 years. My time is running short, so I'll stop my litany, but I think the tendencies and examples given justify the conclusion that the practice of election journalism introduces a distortion into the presidential selection process that serves to benefit some candidates at the expense of others, what I might call random partisanship, that makes it difficult for candidates to get their message across and confounds the voters' effort to understand their choice. Can the press do better? Can it cut its distorting lens from, say, a power of four to a power of two? Maybe. The press could begin by recognizing that although news conventions and values drive its election coverage, a different standard of newsworthiness is already applied to presidential election campaigns. Once the campaign begins in earnest, there are stories daily about a presidential election, whether or not anything of significance is happening in that campaign. Because the journalists are so tightly focused on the candidates, they naturally tend to focus on questions of strategy and questions of tactics. But the press could stop back, step back from the campaign trail and take a look at the needs of the electorate. Voters need time and repetition to learn. Speeches that are old to the journalists are often new to the voters. And journalists, in fact, have made fairly substantial and sincere efforts in the last two elections to introduce some of this content into their coverage. But it seems to me that they could go further. For example, CBS in the 1980 general election did not at any time do a retrospective report on Ronald Reagan's tenure as governor and what might be learned from that tenure about a Reagan presidency. But I'd like to conclude my talk where it began. Even the best-intentioned press cannot carry the burden of organizing public debate and choice in a presidential election campaign. News values and imperatives simply won't allow it. Lippmann's prediction that the press will always magnify defects in political organization is the proposition that I find most fruitful. The possibility of the New Hampshireization of the presidency exists because the parties have seen fit to allow that state's primary to be an outlier. That the press, with its game perspective and nose for news, will further elevate the importance of New Hampshire seems to me absolutely certain. Profound improvements in election news will come only with profound improvements in the structure of the presidential selection process, a possibility that I also think is unlikely. Thank you. In just a moment, I'm going to ask our three other panelists to comment, if they choose to, on the remarks of Professor Patterson. But I, I want to tell you also that we're, we have about six questions here, which I will uh, pose to the panel. They will answer. And uh, at the conclusion of the answers to those six questions, then we invite your participation. And we'll have at least a 30-minute question and answer session from the audience. But having said that, uh, Mr. Gailey, would you lead off? Do you have any comments you'd like to make to that? Well, maybe a few. I feel like I ought to crawl under the table and hide my face for this business I'm in. Uh, I, I think both you and uh, Mr. Patterson did touch on one of the problems, and that is the fact that the political party, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, uh, 
allow New Hampshire and Iowa to have the special status outside the uh, nominating uh, process window. And uh, th that sets up the game, and I really don't know how we can play it much differently than we do. I, I agree with a lot of uh, Mr. Patterson's criticism about the uh, way we magnify the results uh, coming out of New Hampshire or even Iowa. Mr. Scott, let me interrupt you. Since this is a Massachusetts audience here, how does the entry of Governor Dukakis affect the way you're going to cover New Hampshire? Does it, will it still have the same import it had before? Well, that, uh, that's a good question, it, and it's being, uh, I think, debated uh, uh, in the political community now. There are some who think that uh, Dukakis will be a, a virtual favorite son in New Hampshire, and that uh, in that case, uh, uh, if he wins or does well, he won't get the credit he deserves, and if he doesn't do well or meet expectations, uh, uh, he could be written off. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work out. I'm going to uh, do whatever the people of Massachusetts uh, wish. <laughs> we'll take a poll. The other point I want to make, uh, uh, there's always uh, a question of why we don't uh, devote more space and time to issues. Well, uh, these days, as you know, presidential campaigns start as soon as the uh, election for the last one is over, and it seems like we're in a period of nonstop campaigning. And uh, I don't know how many times you can write the story of a candidate's uh, position on issues. I know that the New York Times runs uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, text on their basic <coughs> speeches. I know we do issue pieces. But uh, my God, how many times can you write about uh, Gary Hart's new ideas or Bruce Babbitt's uh, heretical ideas. Uh, uh, I think we do a pretty good job of laying out issues, but I, I just really wonder how many people uh, take the trouble and time to read these uh, god-awful gray pages of the New York Times that are filled with that stuff. And so uh, if, if anybody can come up with a better way for us to educate the public on issues, I, w I would like to hear about it. Mr. Shribman has a new way to do it. Mr. Shribman, let's hear from you. Still, I'm still astonished that the representative of the Wall Street Journal should be sitting to the left of Governor Robb and Mr. Bumpers. Um, uh, I'm the only person uh, in history who's uh, covered a presidential campaign for the New York Times and then went to work for a paper that's even duller. <laughs> so my experience both at the uh, Times and the Journal, I, I join Phil in, in this in saying that I think that we do a fairly good job in covering issues. Um, we, we write, I think, exhaustively uh, to your exhaustion and to ours about where everybody stands on just about everything. And uh, that I think we've done a fairly good job, certainly in the last two elections, in uh, boning up on that. I want to point out something about, um, about this uh, process of New Hampshire and Iowa taking, uh, taking precedence. Uh, I want to explain a little something about how we operate. When we travel around, somebody else pays our expenses. And uh, I want to assure you that if it were up to us, we would have those expenses paid uh, in Captiva, Florida, rather than Nashua, New Hampshire, and in San Francisco, rather than Sioux City, Iowa. The um, process uh, was set up by some of the folks here on the panel, by politicians generically, and that uh, if uh, New Hampshire and Iowa seem to take too much um, precedence, and I think it behooves uh, the people whose uh, lives and destinies depend on, on, on um, politics to change it. Uh, we didn't make New Hampshire and Iowa first, and we'd rather spend February elsewhere. <laughs> uh, can hear. I agree that uh, the media is not necessarily the one who that is well served by New Hampshire and Iowa. Uh, having spent weekends already in Manchester and Na Nashua, I agree with David. Uh, I think it's the Democratic Party that is well served because I think if some very focused states like that weren't the first primary and caucus states, you wouldn't have the candidacies of the uh, Babbitts and the Gephardts and the Dukakises who enliven the process for the party so much. They could not compete 
on a massive first primary basis. If Super Tuesday opened the process, these people wouldn't have a chance. On Dukakis, Mr. Starr, we'll come back to that in just a moment, but isn't it true that these people emerge despite the press rather than because of them? Do they, don't they emerge? For example, Jimmy Carter, Gary Hart never got the time of day in uh, 76 and 84. Well, uh, to cross parties for a second, it's interesting. I was at a breakfast with uh, Pete DuPont the other morning, and he said he is amazed by the amount of coverage he gets in Iowa and New Hampshire. Not necessarily New Hampshire coverage, but the local papers that give him an opportunity to voice his opinions, his issues. He says, I can't believe it. When I, this is what he said. When I speak, they actually write it down and put it in the paper. And, <laughs> and I, some others find that unbelievable, too, obviously. Uh, you know, but I think this wouldn't have happened if you had 20 primaries the first time. Pete DuPont wouldn't get a forum. He's getting a forum in some states, which I think my colleagues will admit, the voters there take the responsibility incredibly seriously. Uh, they are diligent. Uh, I wouldn't have chosen it, but I think you did, and I think for very specific reasons. And I do want to make one point about uh, Governor Dukakis. New Hampshire has not always been kind to its uh, neighboring candidates. Uh, Muskie, Ted Kennedy have all faltered there. and. Uh, Bruce Babbitt um, says that when he goes into an audience in New Hampshire, he's not the slightest bit uh, surprised when he's, uh, he's uh, handed a set of position papers from a citizen and given an envelope and asked for his positions uh, in, uh, by return mail. And that kind of process couldn't happen if, um, if candidates were flying from um, between Houston, Dallas, uh, Atlanta, and a few other places. That it's, it's retail politics, it's it's hand-to-hand um, -hand and heart-to-heart -heart politics, and it um, it's wonderful to see, but it's also the, the, um, the effect it has on uh, presidential candidates, I think, is actually pretty good. Gentlemen, let me get into our first question here. It seems an absolute fact that the higher a candidate is in the polls, the more coverage he gets. Uh, that seems to me to be an economic decision by both the networks and the print media, that obviously if you have a chance to cover uh, somebody who is standing around at 1% in the polls or Jesse Jackson, and those are the only two people who appear at a particular forum. Uh, Jesse Jackson is going to get uh, the evening news. If it's Senator Hart or Bruce Babbitt, I think the economics dictate that since everybody in the audience knows, either the readership or the viewing audience knows Senator Hart, it's only natural that they put him on. So it seems like there's a symbiosis between polls and press. That, that, that the symbiosis between press and the polls are mutually uh, reinforcing. So the first question is, how do you determine? How do you determine how much coverage you're going to give a candidate? As I pointed out a moment ago, Jimmy Carter got very little publicity in Iowa in 1976. Got very little publicity uh, in, in New Hampshire, and the same thing happened to Senator Hart in 1984. How do you decide how much coverage you're going to give these people? Glenn and Mondale were everything in 1984. Everybody else was around 2%. Uh, Askew, Hollings, Hart, Cranston, and, and they got no coverage at all. So how do you make that decision? I can Let me go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I can assure you, had you entered the race, we would have given you uh, Plenty yeah, of coverage. Nice. You tell me. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what your poll standing was, but uh, you had that uh, certain quality, I think, that we would uh, all welcome to the race, and we'd have been out there with you day and night. Well, maybe days. And, uh, Watch that hot <laughs> And I, I uh, sure, uh, I think polls do figure into uh, uh, the front runnership. But if you look at the two front runners uh, we have right now, uh, Gary Hart on the Democratic side, is that still operative? Uh, uh, I would say so. Okay, well, he is not a front runner in the classic sense. He, uh, George Bush is a front runner uh, in that mold. He has uh, much of the Republican establishment behind him. He has money. He has, uh, has all the things that are traditionally associated with the front runner status. Gary Hart. Uh, uh, he has money problems. He has uh, he has uh, other problems, and 
and I, you know, he's a different kind of front runner. Uh, but how do we decide how much coverage we give? Uh, well, obviously, uh, these guys are getting probably more attention than they would uh, care to have, uh, both Bush and Hart. But down the line, uh, Bruce Babbitt, uh, I find him to be interesting. I, I like the way his mind works. And uh, every chance I get, I, uh, I like to hitch up with him and uh, see, see what he's going to do in Iowa or New Hampshire. Uh, Jesse Jackson, we can't, uh, you know, we, we keep uh, looking at Jesse's candidacy in terms of what it might uh, mean in Super Tuesday voting. Uh, Gephardt, uh, you know, I think this is another thing. This field of candidates we have in 88 uh, is unlike uh, any I can remember uh, in my very young uh, past, but uh, I think they're all extremely bright, able, and fascinating and, I, and I, uh, I don't think we're going to be too uh, unfair in the way we distribute our coverage uh, because I think they're all engaging interesting people. Mr. Starr? Well, obviously there is a, a symbiotic relationship of sorts. When we go out on the campaign trail, Governor uh, Dukakis and uh, Bush and Dole, they get certain reporters covering their campaigns and the premier reporters cover the top candidates and thus they have a priority relationship. But I think for someone I've been watching very carefully, Governor Dukakis, who is running at 3% in Iowa and 1% in California, gets a staggering amount of national attention. He's been in George Will, he's been in Mary McGrory, he's been in David Broder. I've seen two NBC News pieces. He's Time Magazine, Newsweek, have all profiled him at some length. Uh, if someone has a message, if someone has a record that uh, seizes the imagination, I think they do penetrate. And I just want to make one other point uh, on the earlier presentation. I think both Geraldine Ferraro's tax issue and the Gary Hart issue now are potentially very important issues. And I think that the fact that they got a lot of coverage is not a tr press travesty. Mr. Shribbin? I don't think, um, well, first of all, I think that uh, most of us will go wherever the, uh, the interesting characters are. That uh, George McGovern ran for president, you may recall, both in 1972 and last time around. And a lot of people wrote about George McGovern last time because he was kind of an interesting character and he had some interesting things to say. Just as um, I always, as Phil said, I always like to talk to um, Bruce Babbitt and I find Pierre DuPont one of the most interesting guys in the race. Uh, I find Gephardt interesting. They're all interesting. Uh, it's, an, it's an astonishing crowd, and I think most of us, uh, when we set out to do stories, are just interested uh, at this stage, anyhow, in writing about interesting people and in this fairly interesting process. Um, the, the, uh, to turn the coin around a little bit, I don't think that uh, uh, Governor Carter or Senator Hart in 76 and 84 uh, really have much to complain about if they want to complain about not getting much coverage because they obviously did something right uh, both in both times. In fact, Senator Hart says now, this was long before this most recent contretemps, Senator Hart says now that one of the things he's worried about is that he's getting too much coverage and that folks like Phil and I, who've been traveling around together for, for five or six years, um, tend to turn up uh, in places where he'd rather not have us be. That, um, and I don't mean in front of his townhouse. Uh, he says when he goes and speaks to a town meeting in Littleton, New Hampshire, that he'd rather not have us there because we are, we do in a way um, kind of change the atmosphere. He's more and more kind of trying to keep us out of meetings uh, with eight or 10 or 12 people in, in uh, people's living rooms in, um, in New Hampshire and Iowa because he'd rather have that one-on-one -on -one contact. So uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that uh, Necessarily, all this press coverage is necessarily a uh, great blessing for some of these people. Well, I'm sorry we don't have somebody here from the uh, one of the networks because really this particular question probably addresses itself more to television coverage than anything else. I am absolutely certain that television stations uh, do exactly as they did in 1984, and that is they followed uh, Senator Glenn and uh, Vice President Mondale. The rest of them did feel put upon because they were limited in resources and they're depending on the evening news for uh, getting known and so on, and they felt uh, terribly uh, adversely affected by it. 
Well, to get on with the show, Chuck, did you want to say anything? No. To get on with the show, the second part of the question deals with something we already touched on, and that's Iowa and uh, New Hampshire. And to what extent, for what reasons, uh, are the importance of Iowa and New Hampshire inflated? So let me give you a couple of things to think about while you're thinking about your answer. In 1984, of 616 network stories, and as I apologize again because we don't have somebody from the networks here, of 616 network stories, New Hampshire got 250. This is during the entire primary process of 1984. New Hampshire got 250 or 40% of the total network stories in 1984. Uh, California, the California and New York primaries combined that got one twentieth of that amount of coverage. Now, the 8,403,000 voters who vote in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, North Carolina, and California, there's eight, almost eight and a half million voters, got much, much less coverage than the media gave in New Hampshire. And then the other thing, of course, is the way they proclaim these things. I remember when Tom Pettit proclaimed Ronald Reagan out of it after Iowa. And uh, I remember how Senator Hart was not taken very seriously. And the network story was not that Mondale got 45% of the vote in Iowa. It was that Hart got 15%. And, uh, and Glenn, who got 5% in Iowa, then became almost and also ran from that moment on. And if I could just make one other observation, I think normally the South would have been much more kindly disposed towards Senator Glenn. He probably was more philosophically attuned to the South than some of the other candidates were. But the South is like anybody else. They will not accept somebody until they prove themselves viable uh, in other places. And I think any Southern candidate this year will almost have to prove himself to be viable in Iowa and New Hampshire in order to be accepted by his own. Well, having said all of that, is it overblown? Should it be changed? And if so, how? Let me say one thing about the uh, references to the uh, extensive coverage that Iowa and New Hampshire commands. Uh, I think what's important is not so much where these candidates campaign as how they campaign, what they talk about, what they tell us in that campaign about their political character and and values. And to the extent that uh, they're campaigning in Iowa, New Hampshire, uh, they are being covered heavily by national uh, press, uh, major newspapers, magazines, television networks. That coverage is not limited to Iowa and New Hampshire audiences. It is, uh, it is available for the entire country. Voters all over the country have access to this. And I would I have nothing to back this up with, but my hunch is that the electorate probably forms more opinions and about these candidates on the basis of the coverage uh, out of New Hampshire and Iowa than they do uh, at any other uh, juncture of the campaign, because uh, there are really two kinds of campaigns, the kind David described in Iowa and New Hampshire, on the ground, hand-to-hand, -hand, after that, it pretty well takes off and, and becomes the so-called, you know, media circus or television campaign that we, uh, that we all are so uh, concerned about. But uh, I think uh, to the extent that what happens in Iowa and New Hampshire is covered intelligently and thoroughly and uh, responsibly, I think that's a benefit for the whole country, for voters everywhere. It's, you have got to put them somewhere on the ground. and, and uh, once they're there, I think it's just a big television studio. That's the backdrop. 1987, for the entire year, that's where the candidates are. Uh, they're there because those are the first events. The media isn't saying, uh, uh, Senator Hart, would you uh, please go to New Hampshire so we can do a story on you? That's where they are. Uh, and there's, there's, there's actually, there's um, some redeeming value to all of this. Um, if you go campaigning with... Um, uh, Congressman Gephardt or with Governor DuPont or Governor Dukakis in uh, one of the smaller states in New Hampshire, um, th there's a chance that you'll actually get to talk to him if you're, a, uh, if you're a voter, to say nothing of the chance you might get if you're a reporter. Uh, if, you're, if you happen to be 
uh, in the town square in Franklin, New Hampshire. Uh, and it's a good place to be because nobody misses it. None of the campaigns do. Um, then you get a chance to talk to just about everybody who's running for president. And uh, once, once the process gets going, once it becomes a tarmac campaign, it's not really a campaign at all. What's happening in New Hampshire uh, and Iowa, and it happens for almost two years, is an actual presidential campaign. People are running uh, for president, and they're actually asking people right in front of them, looking them eye to eye, to vote for them. I mean, Congressman Gephardt is running for president in Iowa, much the way he ran for alderman in St. Louis. He's running for president on the notion that if he can only have breakfast with enough people, he'll win. Uh, so far, he's had a breakfast with an astonishing number of people, and I think he'll do a lot better than a lot of folks, other folks do, simply because he's mastered the hand-to-hand, -hand retail kind of politics, and um, the kinds of, kinds of pedestrian encounters in which most of us uh, who don't live on television um, live our lives. Most of us spend our lives going to Buick dealerships and to hardware stores, and that's how folks are running for president in these two states. And it's, uh, they're actually forced to go into people's living rooms, and they're actually forced to say why they want to be president. And it's a, it's a process that I think um, has a lot to commend itself, because you can't really fool, if any of you have driven north of the border here, you can't really fool some of those folks. And if you can fool them, you can't do it too often. So I think that the process that, that forces people to go into living rooms and to talk to people uh, is a process that I think um, should be revered and cherished. I also think, you know, the Republicans a couple weekends ago got Bush, Dole, Kemp, Rumsfeld, Haig, DuPont, and Robertson up in Nashua, New Hampshire, and they did talk about issues. I'm not sure if there were 20 elections that they could have found a focal point. Let me just see if I can stir things up here just a little bit. I was resisting the temptation to become involved because I know you want to hear from the media representatives. But let me, let me suggest to you that the real question is not so much, notwithstanding the fact that I've made reference to a chart here and, and the distorted uh, size of the places, because as Phil or someone pointed out, you really cover the candidates where they are, and I think what they say is really more important than where they happen to be. I would suggest that the critical issue that we're looking at tonight is measurement, where you measure their performance. And that's the concern, at least that a number of us have had, and why we started in this uh, Super Tuesday evolution to try to present a broad-based test where what a president does is going to be wholesale politics. You have to be able to work the streets. You have to be able to do certain things. You have to, as some of you may read a Washington Post story, be concerned about a precinct captain in Iowa and buy a little figurine uh, dog or whatever it was and make a special case of presenting that to that precinct worker in Iowa and hope that that's going to cause the campaign to suddenly take off. But that's really not what being president of the United States is all about. And the concern here is that you have two fine but relatively small states. They're small. They're relatively predictable, and hence they're subject from time to time by any savvy politician to some sense of, I don't like to really use the word manipulation, but that, that gives you the sense of what I'm talking about. It may be that the sense of what kind of litmus tests are presented, that you don't necessarily test a candidate's ability to talk about a broad national vision for the country as opposed to uh, subscribing to a particular litmus test of any interest group, many of them very worthy and, and worthy of our support individually. That's the concern that I think a number of us have with the whole concept of the distortion, not because it happens to be those states, fine people, but because they're so small that you don't necessarily test presidential vision in that particular category. Any comment? Well, this time around, you're giving, uh, you're getting quite a different test from um, Iowa and New Hampshire. You used to be able to say with, um, with certainty that there were two states that were predominantly white, predominantly um, rural, and, uh, and whose behavior were fairly predictable. This time, you can say that, um, uh, that uh, there are two sides of the economic coin, that the uh, Iowa presents presidential candidates and voters um, with the notion of dispossession, with the notion of um, economic um, distress uh, and one specific discrete issue that uh, any president has to uh, answer, and that's the farm question. Whereas uh, New Hampshire presents the other side of the coin, uh, it's part of the, the bi-coastal economy, uh, it's the lowest unemployment of any state in the Union for the past four years running, uh, it's no longer a rural state, it's more, it's more a suburb of, of Boston than probably Woburn is now. And, um, 
it, uh, it presents different sorts of challenges to, to presidents. Uh, so um, it's, not, it's not quite as bad as it may, it may well used to have been. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't yet sense that there's very much litmus test activity out in Iowa. Uh, in fact, uh, this is my observation. Uh, it strikes me that the closest thing we have to an interest group candidate or a candidate who's uh, pitching his campaign at special interest groups this year is uh, your predecessor is, is chairman of the DLC, uh, Dick Gephardt. Uh, uh, he has the uh, trade amendment, which uh, has made him very uh, popular with labor. Uh, he's got he's sharing uh, sponsorship of an agriculture bill with Senator Harkin. And uh, if you look look at the way he's playing the game tactically out there, he's about as close as you'll come. I'm not saying he is. I'm saying he's as close as you'll come to a candidate playing the interest group uh, game. I think you ought to send him a letter. You know, I don't, know. I, I don't want to comment except to say that he's a longtime friend, and we've tried to send that letter. You know, I don't know whether you're suggesting that campaigning in Iowa or New Hampshire doesn't necessarily uh, – show what it takes to be president or I'm not sure campaigning has anything to do no matter where it is with what the qualities of being a great president uh, I think the race on a much more massive scale whether it was Super Tuesday or not measures more than anything a candidate's established position and his ability to raise money and uh, buy big buys in the media market and I don't think as I get back to the point Gephardt or Babbitt or Dukakis could make the impression that I think they're making on a broader scale. I had uh, a couple of questions I'm going to eliminate simply because of, of uh, time constraints, but I want to read a short quote here from David Broder in order to get into my next question. Here's what he said in the Washington Post. Neither the television networks nor newspapers nor magazines have the resources of people, space, and time to describe and analyze the dynamics of two, simultaneously, two simultaneous half-national elections among Republicans and Democrats with seven or eight choices in each party. That task is simply beyond us. Since we cannot reduce the number of states voting on Super Tuesday, we have to reduce the number of candidates treated as serious contenders. Those news judgments will be arbitrary, but not subject to appeal. Those who finish first or second in Iowa and New Hampshire will get tickets from the mass media to play in the next big round. Those who don't, won't. A brokered Democratic convention? No way. Big media will prevent it. Now, the next question is, does the media have a vested interest in winning the field? because they simply don't have the resources to cover eight candidates on the Democratic side and perhaps that many on the Republican side in 20 different states. And is that comment by David Broder a fair one? Mark? Well, I, I don't know if uh, the networks have the resources anymore. They once had the resources to cover about 25 candidates with three crews each. Uh, but this is obviously going to be a different year, and uh, we saw early in the campaign, I think, uh, Senator Hart had trouble filling one of his planes, uh, and he had to get a smaller plane for one of his trips because, of course, the media buys the seats on Hart, those let planes. Let me interrupt just a second, and I apologize for this, but let me ask you this question. Isn't the media guilty, both the print and the television media, guilty of setting up certain expectations. Isn't that a way to eliminate people? They set up an expectation, and if he doesn't meet it, he's out. But that's a reasonable basis of analysis. We do that in all kinds of coverage. We do it in sports. If Notre Dame plays Fordham and beats them by a point, everyone calls it a great game for Fordham. It's a reasonable way to look at it. If somebody goes into a campaign with millions of dollars, with the endorsement of every special interest in the state, and can only do a certain amount, it's reasonable to say that wasn't a great performance. Now, where we draw those lines is difficult and is subjective. But it would be silly just to call uh, Mondale the big winner because he got 40% of the vote. Just as silly to call Ed Muskie a loser because he got 45%? It might have been silly, but it's reasonable to try and make the analysis. 
it might have been a faulty analysis. Well, how are you? How would you personally suggest you handle the situation of Governor DeConcus in New Hampshire? Is that if he gets 45 percent of the vote, is he going to be a loser? No, if he gets 45 percent, he's going to be a big winner. Is he? Yeah. Huge. Well, let's pursue that a little further. <laughs> how many does he need to get to keep from being a loser? Tell, no. us, tell us how many candidates we're going yeah. to have in the race I, first. You guys are even more arbitrary than I thought you were. I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is it going to be 30 percent? Is he out if he uh, gets 30 percent or less in New Hampshire? He can't. Where are you going to draw the line? A year ahead of events, he cannot finish worse than second and within a stone's throw of second place. That's what I would say. You mean as in first place? Of uh, first place. Mr. Shribben, how do you feel about that? Agree. If he um, if he can't if he uh, finishes sixth in the pack in New Hampshire, then uh, reasonable people will ask reasonable questions about Governor Dukakis's national political career. What happens to everybody else in the race? Then are they out? Is this the winnowing process we're talking about? Is it then perhaps a heart to Dukakis race? I don't think any of us has any interest, despite what Brother Broder has to say, in winnowing the field. In fact, it's if you were going to take a cynical view of how the press um, regards this, it's the more the merrier. Uh, I don't think we have any interest, uh, personal, professional, um, any impulse uh, to try to winnow the field. Uh, I, I personally would just as soon see six or seven Republicans and Democrats go into uh, Super Tuesday uh, and to see them play, as you all have uh, put it, on different kinds of fields. We will have seen them play in the retail politics, and it would be nice to be able to see them all uh, play in, um, in wholesale politics. I don't think we have any, uh, that we have any interest in winnowing the field, that I think uh, the, the people who pay the bills for these candidates uh, have the interest in winnowing, winnowing the field because they don't want to pay the bills anymore. In fact, I've always wanted to cover a broker yeah, convention. Right. I was going to say, yeah, all of us do. wouldn't it be fun in Atlanta? Well, you're going to have to go get David Broder to change his mind. We can't have one unless he changes his mind. Broder wrote Mondale out of the race after the main caucuses in 84, so I'm going to give him a chance to rethink this. <laughs> just, uh, just one minute or less to all three of you. Do you feel that there's a chance of a brokered convention this year? This has nothing to do with the media, but just to... Uh, Political question. No. Next question. Uh, uh, there hasn't been a second ballot in the convention since 1952, and I don't think we're going to get one now. Mark, you agree with that? I think it's unlikely, but I think this year it's possible, especially if the hard candidacy self-destructs. And uh, there are a bunch of lesser-known candidates that could really uh, change things. Maybe and one non-candidate. Maybe an Arkansas well, candidate. Yes. Well, What's his Virginia. name? Why do you think I raised the question? <laughs> can we wrap this up so I can get to a telephone? <laughs> we have now consumed an hour and uh, still did not get to three dynamite questions I had. But uh, in the interest of keeping my promise to you, I'd like very much to open it to the floor now. And uh, I'll try my very best to see you in the, in the galleries up there because the lights uh, are so stout it's very difficult to see, but we'll try to at least get a couple of questions out of each gallery and on the floor. Are there any questions now from the floor? Yes. I would like to hopefully get at least one substantial matter discussed, especially for Mr. Schribman and, and Professor Patterson, but also for others. Use a concrete example. In previous election, the current vice president graciously called certain approach to economics in which increase in defense, reduction in taxes, and balanced budget are all promised at the same time as voodoo economics. Now, he was very gracious to the current president because I think it's much closer to a Ponzi sc scheme which originated in Boston. Now, maybe Mr. Schriebman could explain Ponzi scheme. I just in one sentence say it was finding a greater sucker to pay the debts and the high interest rate on the previous one. Now, in Ponte's scheme, the sake was self-chosen. He chose to buy into that program of a, a con man. Now, in case of 200 years of past generations are equaled now by national debt, 
in future generations, the children and great grandchildren were not asked. Now, Sir, this is I, not. If I may, this has not been discussed. Let me just finish. I'm I finishing this sentence. That, that question really does not go to the reason we're here. It's a it goes to the very reason. Question. If I, if you let me finish the question, the press has not covered it, and I'm, I'm asking Mr. Shriman, as Wall Street journalists interested in in financial matters, are you intend to cover the question of the unbalanced budget by a party, Republican Party, who prides itself on balanced budget, and how will that substantive question be de dealt? in the context of political system, uh, Professor Pedersen. Let, yeah. let me answer that question. I, I thought it was yeah. foolish. I voted against all of it because I knew my second grade arithmetic teacher would be whirling in her grave if I believed that. And uh, I don't know that that is a question for the panelists. It is a question for the members of the House and the Senate. Some voted for it and some voted against it for reasons best known to themselves. I, you're very fortunate to have me here tonight to say that I agree with you totally on that. <laughs> Are there other questions? Yes. I was just reading some in-depth analysis in USA Today, and uh, <laughs> which maybe is an oxymoron, I don't know, um, about this whole heart thing. And one of the points that was made in there, and actually it's a pretty good one, it seems to me, is that presidential candidates and maybe public figures, political figures in general, are being held to, to much higher standards by the press and, and perhaps by the consumers of the news than they have been in generation or in years past. Uh, I think a couple of months ago there's an article in the Times on uh, Dave Durenberger and some problems he's had with his personal life and you know it's a really pretty explicit uh, discussion of you know psychological history and so forth, psychiatric history. Um, and now we have the Gary Hart thing. It, it used to be, I think, I believe the phrase was wheels up, rings off, uh, in terms of the presidential campaign planes or uh, press planes in general. And that certainly doesn't seem to be the case now uh, with the Hart thing, with other matters. I wonder if you could comment on if you think it's a different, first of all, and if so, why is there that change? <laughs> Well, I, I think it's different. I think um, uh, one of the reasons it's different is that we're all uh, from a different generation, I think, um, that uh, we have different ideas of what the press ought to be uh, from a different generation, I think, um, that uh, we have different ideas of what the press ought to do. Um, there is some, some feeling, although not all of us embrace it uh, totally, that uh, the public less well understands uh, it's um, political figures if it doesn't know, if it's kept from uh, knowing certain certain elements of their lives. Um, I would take issue, and I think Phil would, and I think that we all would take issue with this notion of wheels up, uh, rings off. Political, national political reporters are about the dullest group of people I've ever run into. Um, <laughs> David, and, have you ever traveled on a presidential plane? <laughs> yes. Have you? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for the follow-up. There is no follow-up. Okay. But um, I, I think we all look a little more carefully than we used to look at these questions, but I think there's a furious debate raging within our community today um, about whether uh, the sorts of things that were reported in the paper this week um, uh, ought to be reported and how they ought, how, what sort of uh, methods and techniques ought to be employed and I would urge you not to think that uh, we're kind of a monolith. We, um, we're debating this question, I think, uh, with um, equal intensity as just about anybody else, and uh, I don't think there's much agreement yet among those of us in the press about how questions like this ought to be handled. Um, we, there is an agreement that we ought to know a little bit more about our presidential candidates, but I think that's the question about how much more and, and where, the, um, where the line is drawn I think is still open. I agree with that. Mark. Phil and I were talking beforehand, and one thing we did agree on, though, uh, was that perhaps the most important thing we can report on is character these days. Issues are rather transient, and uh, character is something that uh, usually remains through the uh, entire career. And to the extent that a candidate's private behavior begins to reflect on his public character, uh, I think it is a subject that we ought to give some attention. And the Gary Hart story, as all of us in the media know, is not something that suddenly emerged. 
uh, this has only come about when the rumors uh, that have been around for a long time have been elevated, uh, became more persistent and louder. And in the end, Gary Hart challenged the press to follow him he, and uh, asked them to prove what a dull man he was. And the rest, uh, we'll see. I, I think we're going to have uh, at least one big loser in this whole episode. It may be Gary Hart, it may be the press, it may be both. But uh, I personally am not comfortable with the idea of uh, staking out uh, Gary Hart's house. Uh, but uh, I think it's moved beyond uh, that uh, issue. That, that is a separate issue that no doubt will be debated on and on and on journalism ethics. I think it's now become an issue, uh, and I think maybe Mr. Patterson disagrees with me on this, I think it, it has become an issue of, of uh, who's telling the truth, uh, credibility, and uh, what that says about Bill, the man. does the New York Times have a code of ethics? Does it have a booklet defining what is uh, ethical and what isn't for reporters? Well, beyond accepting gifts worth more than $10, I'm not, That's it, I'm not, huh? I'm not <laughs> sure. But, uh, you know, I think it's the kind of thing that, you know, if, if I had gotten a tip uh, that a blonde uh, model was going to rendezvous with Gary Hart in Washington last weekend, uh, I would have I I taken it to my editors, and I, I, I would be amazed if they had said something like, well, go stake out the house, you know. <laughs> and I'm not very good at stakeouts. I tend to drink too much and fall asleep. <laughs> That takes us to the next question. Where does drinking uh, come into the ethics? And uh, I'm kidding, David. Well, uh, we had this this very debate um, in a in a meeting in our office uh, about ten days ago because we had the idea that after Senator Hart had raised the question of these allegations of his being a womanizer, that's his word, not ours, um, that that this question would come up somehow. And we um, we all agreed that. Uh, and somewhat pompously and self-righteously that this was not the sort of thing that, that we like to do. Uh, and yet, um, and I know the, across the street at the Times, having worked there and worked with Phil, that they don't like to do it either. And, um, but someone, someone has done it, and uh, now we're all kind of in the maelstrom, and we all have to kind of confront this question, and I think we confront it with uh, a little bit of embarrassment and with quite a bit of ambivalence, that we're not quite sure what we ought to be doing. I'm, can I say, I'm willing to defend the Miami Herald if no one else wants to do it here. I'm willing to say that given that this man is running for president, given the level of rumors, that for the press to go on reporting this as rumor was irresponsible. But to go and make some attempt to see whether these rumors are in fact true or not was a lot better approach. Question from this gentleman over here. Um, this question... Uh, I'd like the, uh, the media panelists to address. Um, I appreciate the value of retail politics, um, which Iowa and New Hampshire both offer, and also the unique economic uh, existences of Iowa and New Hampshire, especially in 1988. Um, but I was, a paradox seems to result. You've said that the South virtually automatically takes its cue from the two or three candidates that are winnowed out in the New Hampshire and the in the Iowa uh, uh, primary and caucus, respectively. Um, it seems paradoxical, though, that the South is vastly different um, in terms of its representative makeup. And uh, I just wanted to know if that was a factor um, that, that is considered by the media when states like New Hampshire and Iowa have very, very small percentages of minorities um, and other populations that, that have higher percentages in the South. I think you're going to see a lot more of these candidates going into Super Tuesday than uh, some people may think. Uh, I know traditionally after Iowa and New Hampshire, we've gotten it down to two or three candidates who are considered viable. But, uh, but a lot, uh, some of these uh, candidates are, are really just hoping to survive New Hampshire and Iowa to get to Super Tuesday. That is, that is really where their strategy and hopes are, are centered. And I think uh, they'll cut. Yeah, I think you're going to have a lot of them coming in. Some may be limping, and some may be losing altitude. But I think, uh, I think they're going to make it to Super Tuesday. And after that, I think that's when you see the uh, 
drastic cut in the uh, field. But uh, Albert Gore is sure not going to get out before Super Tuesday. Neither is Jesse Jackson. And I'd be surprised if uh, Gephardt or Babbitt uh, does. Mark? Uh, I completely agree. And I'd add Paul Simon, who I think might surprise some people out in Iowa. Yes. Uh, I'd like to uh, follow up a little bit on the heart question again, and, and really the question of, of morality and character and in trying to determine what your coverage is going to be. And I guess there are three questions for three different groups here. First of all, for the two politicians, for Senator Bumpers and uh, Governor Robb, what do you think is fair play? What, if you were running for President of the United States, what would you say, hey, I don't want this to be covered and I don't think it's right to be covered? Second question for, uh, for the journalists. Uh, Senator Hart is not the only politician who's running for president uh, right now who's had rumors about his, his personal life. Uh, and I don't need to mention those. I think if you want to mention them, that's fine. But certainly on both the Republican and the Democratic side, there have been certain uh, candidates who have had rumors uh, spread, it around, spread about them uh, that have not gotten this type of coverage. And in fact, I believe uh, in one instance, which I will mention, I guess uh, uh, Congressman Kemp has tried to bring that up in uh, at least two specific instances with one magazine, Vanity Fair, and I believe uh, also with uh, one of the key teams of reporters to try and bring this issue up first. And I was wondering, when is it that the journalists say, all right, the rumors are now loud enough, we need to cover them? And the third and final question is for Professor Patterson. Is there any study that shows that this type of coverage is the type of coverage that has either a positive or, in fact, a negative or adverse effect more than, say, the general overall coverage of a campaign? And I guess I'd like the, the, both the governor uh, Rob and Senator Bumpers to lead off, please. Okay, let me say it's, it's very difficult to draw an absolute line, but I think it's clear that there has to be some zone of private conduct that any candidate with their family and friends and associates can engage in. If it comes into the sphere where it becomes a public issue or if it crosses over that line in any specific way, or indeed in this case is apparently there was an invitation uh, to, to to cross that line in, in some substantial way. I think you have a different situation. But I would hate to see a situation come about where anyone who gets involved in public office by virtue of the fact that they simply offer for office at any level, and eventually you have to take it uh, to other, other levels, gives up every conceivable right to any kind of private conduct, whatever, or the ability uh, to have personal moments with family, friends, or others. Uh, it, I, I don't know how you draw a hard line between the two, but I think they're clearly, at some point you come to an area that is clearly private conduct, and you, at some point you come to an area that is clear, uh, clearly public or ought to be a matter of public concern, and, and I suspect that you'll gauge how far you go in terms of how closely it, it impacts on whether or not that's relevant to their performance of the duty of the office that they happen to be seeking. Let me say that uh, nobody can answer that with any degree. With, very definitively. I had always believed, uh, when, when I was elected governor in 1971, I used to ponder this question because uh, it's the first time I was just a country lawyer and the first time I'd been a sub subjected to the kind of scrutiny you obviously get running for governor of your state. And I was told by the press then that usually they use this criteria, that if there is some kind of an accusation or a rumor about your character or your private life that is likely to interfere with your performing the duties of the office you seek, then that's fair game. If you've been, for example, if you're going to be governor or almost anything else where there's a kind of a fiduciary relationship, if you, there's an allegation that you've been engaged in financial improprieties, or maybe you've been involved in trying to manipulate the stock market, or maybe you have a volatile temper where you, uh, you throw things, or maybe you have... Uh, Maybe you're not an alcoholic, but you have episodic drinking bouts uh, in which you go out of your gourd. All of those things, and I wouldn't try to make an exhaustive list here tonight. Those just came to mind. It seems to me that things like that are legitimate things for the press to inquire about. Uh, some, I have known some people, uh, you know, I think that uh, Barbara uh, Tuckman in her book, March of Folly, she talks about one of the reasons man has never been able to govern himself. She listed four reasons, but two of them were blind ambition. And I think the press detects that somebody in the race, you know, is blindly ambition and wanted to be president ever since he was elected president of the first grade. 
I think that sort of thing is, is legitimate. Another thing she talked about was just plain incompetence. And I think if a man comes into the political field or a woman comes into the political field from a business or profession, it's fair to go back and see where they respected lawyers, where they respected business people, where there was their integrity uh, considered high. And I'm just sort of rambling here, but I'm saying I do. Th I agree with Governor Robb. I think there are some thresholds. I think there are some lines beyond which the press ought not to go, particularly if it does not affect a man. Doesn't really go to the character of the job, the kind of character he needs to fulfill the job. In short, I think uh, you ought to. I think you ought to look for three qualities. I think first of all, you ought to decide whether a man has a sense of humor or not. Never vote for a man who has, doesn't have a sense of humor because he takes himself too seriously. Uh, secondly, don't uh, don't vote for anybody that has any hang-ups, any sign of paranoia. And thirdly, don't vote for somebody that doesn't know history, because that old saw about he'll repeat it is the truest uh, truism there is. Bill, do you um, want to take the second part of the question, or have you already forgotten what it was? I've forgotten the question. I'll let Mark uh, remind me of what it was. Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to repeat something about Gary Hart and how long the press really has laid off this issue of uh, sexual indiscretion. Uh, Gary Hart emerged from the 84 campaign with a peculiar legacy. He was the front runner, but there were questions about his character, and they stemmed from not sexual activity, but name, age, signature, all these incidents. So character was an issue with Gary Hart coming into here. These rumors had been along, around a long time, but they were not just rumors of infidelity. They were rumors of indiscreet public infidelity, and they were rumors that suggested more or less compulsive behavior. And I think that clearly put it over the line, given the backdrop of the character issues, and the fact that some other candidate might have had an infidelity in his past or her past is not necessarily irrelevant. Irre but I think in this Gary Hart case, it is very relevant. And I can make that distinction. Where the line is is obviously a subjective judgment. Well, I'm, I guess I'm more concerned by how he handles this question now. He is being tested, I think. I think it's a, uh, probably a terrible ordeal for anybody to go through, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how he handles this. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, and as I said earlier, I think the issue is not so much uh, uh, his private life now as uh, his credibility. Uh, and unfortunately, I guess we uh, sometimes don't do a very good job of sizing up the presidential candidate's character. It, in uh, President Reagan's case, I think it's very late in coming, but I think it will begin in the morning with the Iran-Contra hearings. I think the real result of those will probably be to tell us about the character of Ronald Reagan a bit late. David, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, just briefly, um, that, uh, to remind all of you that uh, what we practice, just as what these other gentlemen practice here, is an imperfect art that um, we make uh, decisions uh, sometimes when we're tired or on airplanes, we make them because we, we happen to be near a phone. Um, and that uh, we, we don't feel, I don't think, I think I speak for all of us, that we don't feel uh, that uh, people who go into public life should cede any right to any personal life. Um, but what happens in cases like this, and this is a, just about the best example there is, is that um, that there'll be an incident or there'll be one story written and it will take on a life of its own. And whether the Wall Street Journal or New York Times or Newsweek or the Des Moines Register or the Salem Evening News decided that they wanted to write about Gary Hart's sex life, um, that uh, will be to any of us who don't have a story in the paper tomorrow. Uh, we didn't have one today um, and uh, we, we will have one tomorrow. Uh, and uh, the reason is, the reason is that the um, presidential race uh, has taken a uh, rather dramatic turn in the past 24 hours. We, didn't, we don't necessarily root for, for uh, these things to happen. We don't necessarily have any stake in it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the presidential race has taken on, you'll forgive the phrase, a different character this morning, uh, tomorrow morning than it will have had two days ago. And um, it now is less really a question uh, in one way of, um, of uh, 
of uh, sexual conduct. Now it's a political story. Um, the story is whether the presidential race has been uh, changed utterly. And uh, I think all of us would agree that the, that the um, political race is a different one than it was a couple of days ago, and I think we'll be to any of us who ignore that. I remember uh, when they began to uncover some of Billy Bront's uh, peccadillos, he just simply said, I never told you I was an angel, and got by with it. One of the dangers of this sort of thing, and I think about a hypothetical case, not the instant case, but one of the things I think about is, what if this were in the general, Republican and Democrat going down to the wire, and we'll say, hypothetically, the Democrat was leading by a wide margin, perceived as infinitely superior to the Republican candidate. And uh, some discovery like this comes up and changes the whole outcome of the election and causes an absolute incompetent to be elected, not only an incompetent, but one who, if the facts were known, might have had a much bigger skeleton in his closet than the one that was reported. Now, those are things just, uh, that's a hypothetical case that could happen. Maybe this would be handled differently in a situation like this, but it just shows uh, how this can really distort the political process in such a way that all America could wind up a loser. I'd hate to think our presidents aren't held to as high a standard as our TV ministers. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you should check all the other television ministers out. And, uh, <laughs> I don't think we're going around jerking doors open and, and staking out uh, bedrooms to the extent this may all suggest. Uh, uh, there are a lot of candidates out there, and there have been in past elections, where this has not uh, happened. And, uh, and I, I, I hope it's you know, more of an exception than anything else. But uh, th this, there, there's one, uh, uh, one thing worth noting about Mr. Hart's case. Uh, it was he uh, who raised, first uh, raised the so-called womanizing issue on his campaign plane a few weeks ago, suggesting that some of his uh, opponents uh, or their aides were spreading these rumors. That created about a two or three day uh, uh, tempest. Uh, and then, uh, as, as we've all read, uh, he then uh, invited reporters to, to follow him around and assured them that they would be very bored uh, by what they uh, found. I'm not uh, defending the Miami Herald, uh, but I, I do think uh, that that's a difference worth noting. We just have one time for one quick question left. I'm told our time is almost up. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, given, I'd like to follow up on Professor Patterson's point in the beginning that it seems that the press follows the uh, presidential race like a game. And it seems that at least in the year before there is even any voting, uh, that often the, the way they cover it is mistaken. I refer back to especially the Democratic contest in 1983, 84, when it was basically all Mondale and Glenn in the coverage, and, it, and you know, Gary Hart emerged, um, despite the press. And Newsweek said in June that he would be the first candidate to drop out. And even the day of the New Hampshire primary, the New York Times had a front page story saying that Walter Mondale had the largest lead in the history of the race ever. Um, my question is, uh, first, given that it seems that often this game coverage turns out to be irrelevant, why does the press persist in covering the election like a game and all these horse race stories uh, since really in the end that whole year of coverage, at least as far as the horse race is concerned, turns out to be irrelevant? Um, and secondly, how would, has there been any thought and how would you feel about a proposal since the media has become such a large part of the process witness this forum tonight to the press cover, instituting covering itself? And following up on what Mr. Shribman said about how they do make decisions under time lag and under de uh, deadlines and whatnot, it seems that uh, there hasn't really, that hasn't really happened since Timothy Krause's book, The Boys in the Bus, which was a very illuminating book, but it was written in 1972. And how would you feel about maybe instituting some kind of ombudsman role for the press to cover the press? David. Well, uh... I think we've done that. We, last in, in um, 1984, the journal uh, assigned uh, a very talented reporter, Jane Mayer, to cover the press full time. And her beat, uh, and when I wasn't working at the journal throughout the entire um, campaign, uh, uh, I remember being under Jane Mayer's scrutiny when I worked uh, with Phil at the New York Times. And that we, and that I think um, uh, more and more uh, we're doing that, that we're covering, um, we're covering two or three parts of that. 
Uh, one, um, there's, also, there's always a distinction made between the free media and the paid me media. We're the free media. We come cheap. Uh, the free media is the kind of, um, is the kind of uh, press you get when you go out and run for president. The paid media is the kind of press you buy uh, when you put an ad on television. So uh, we haven't dealt with this uh, paid media at all. But more and more scrutiny is going into that, and I suspect you're right, that um, one of the things that all three of us have been begging you to do all evening, and it just occurred to me, is that um, none of you really understand how, it, how we work, uh, that you don't understand um, that we can't, uh, we can only call our offices two or three times a day and, 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 um, and talk to them for, for little bits of five minutes each, uh, that we can't call our wives or husbands, uh, that we, um, when we cover presidential candidates, uh, we often, although this is changing, uh, fly around uh, in a um, sensory deprivation unit, an airplane, in which we don't meet any normal human beings for months on end. And uh, I think we've begun to uh, understand that, and I think to the extent to which we let you understand that better in 88, we'll be doing a better job. I must admit, we have these meetings every four years. Uh, I've had them at other publications where we try to discuss how we're not going to cover it as a horse race, how we're going to just try and find focuses. And last time uh, we made some attempts and we did some different things. In fact, post-election we produced a making of the president in three days, which, used, you know, was the old Teddy White trick. But in the end, much of that stuff is boring, unreadable, repetitive. And in the end, it is a horse race, and the politicians treat it like a horse race. And we're just, to a large extent, covering what's out there. It's very imperfect. We're not always proud of it. And we discuss ways to change it. But. I'm wondering if maybe uh, we won't be forced to take a, uh, another look at how we covered the, even the horse race uh, and maybe come up with some uh, better ideas, uh, simply because we have such a large field of candidates out there. We, we're going to have about 15 candidates, I think, in the two parties to cover. And that's a, that's a lot of horses running. And uh, I think the television networks, for money reasons and other reasons, are, are trying to decide how they can cover it differently. And maybe the uh, number of candidates will force all of us to uh, step back and say, is there a better way to do this? And, uh, and, I, and I have a solution for the Iowa and New Hampshire problem. Uh, I uh, suggest that maybe the uh, Democratic Leadership Council start a movement to uh, bring them inside the window for 1992. Senator, can I make a small uh, Absolutely. comment? Absolutely. Uh, I think the, uh, having sat on a number of these panels, uh, I'm always impressed by uh, how well-intentioned journalists are. I think uh, the, uh, the problem of journalism is that journalists have difficulty being journalists. The, um, if Gary Hart had uh, spent his weekend uh, delivering a speech on Central America. Uh, I don't think there would be much news in that, uh, in that particular event. Nor do I think that a code of ethics would generally work uh, because of the dynamics of journalism. Uh, once someone is out there with the story, it's almost impossible for others not to be out there with the same story. Or let's take the example of this evening of wouldn't it be nice if we had six or seven candidates alive uh, after Super Tuesday, the possibility of a brokered convention? Uh, the press would love a brokered convention at convention time, uh, but the press uh, isn't very interested in talking to third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and seventh place winners. And uh, because of that, uh, you're not likely to, to maintain uh, a large field. And finally, I don't think that New Hampshire and Iowa are solely a consequence, although I think they are largely a consequence of the way we have structured our system. Uh, Iowa was not a big encounter uh, until the press made it a big encounter. Uh, New Hampshire, I think, uh, may be different, but uh, it was the press that zeroed in in 1976 uh, on Iowa. Um, and uh, then there was about a fourfold increase in the number of journalists who were in Iowa in 1980. Um, one final small fact, um, in each succeeding presidential election campaign since 1968, there have been more stories each time about the New Hampshire primary. 
with that uh, let me express my thanks to everybody who made this evening possible the kennedy school especially and to all of you who came and participated and i apologize to those of you who had questions that we don't have time to get to we had a time limitation and we have to live with it and with that i'm going to turn the microphone back to our fearless leader uh, governor rob thank you dale let me just join in thanking the kennedy school uh, dean thank you and and for giving us this opportunity to professor patterson uh, for providing the uh, provocation for the night's uh, discussion. Uh, it is a game, but it's an important game, and I, I should probably conclude after thanking all of you for, for participating as one who has been on, on the opposite side along with Senator Bump Bumpers. I think most of us respect the professional journalists in, the, in their attempt to pursue their craft in an objective, uh, fair-handed, and, and uh, committed way. Uh, we may have differences from time to time, but I think most people who have been subjected to the process understand that they're trying to do the best and the fairest job that they can under very difficult circumstances, often made more difficult by those of us that they're attempting to, to cover any, any particular given equation. It's very difficult to put things back in that window, Phil. We've tried, uh, and there is some element of, of the uh, self-fulfilling prophecy when, when something is made bigger than life, it's hard to put it back into manageable standards. But for all of you who have taken the interest tonight to deal with some very uh, difficult, sometimes troubling questions, and those who've expressed an interest in the political process, and particularly this 1988 campaign, it is important. We do have important people uh, who are giving thoughtful answers to some of the questions facing this country. And I hope you will remain interested. And for those who'd like to participate with the Democratic Leadership Council in any of our activities, we'll have some brochures available. With that, Dean, we thank you, we thank one and all for coming, and we bid you a good evening.